And we are live for CCX2 episode 33. Uh, no Luke today. He has no power because of the, I was going to say tornado, hurricane. But we have three other wonderful people here to join us. And we're going to talk about stupid uh, slash negligent gun owners and what makes them. So uh, we got a bunch of people. So we have Dan Zimmerman from T-Tag. Again, welcome, Dan. Good to be here. Thanks. Jacob Paulson from concealedcarry.com. He's been on a couple times, too. Welcome, Jacob. Howdy, 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 howdy. And Sal and Bob. Now, now Jason. <laughs> yes, uh, Halloween is Saturday, right? It's Halloween or yeah, tomorrow? I know. So yeah. Saturday. I think. Saturday. Okay. Yeah. So Bob is a festive guy. So you know he's in the zone. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the only one. I was gonna I was gonna carve a pumpkin and and put it in the back, but I didn't get around to it. So. <laughs> uh let's see quick housekeeping we have so we weren't here last week because we forgot that it was the same night as the presidential debate same time too so we skipped it and so we have a winner from the week prior which uh he already commented it's sean mcneely who's a regular so sean you won two weeks ago the giveaway uh send <laughs> send luke an email <laughs> <laughs> Luke at usacarry.com. He will get you hooked up with this stuff. And we'll do another giveaway this week like we usually do. So we'll have um, hats, uh, stickers, patches, that kind of stuff. All you have to do is ask a question and you are entered. And then we announce the winner at the beginning of next week's episode. So, oh, here's somebody from Austin, Texas. Yeah, Jacob, neighbor of mine. Right? You guys might really be neighbors. Who knows? Oh, Sean's like, Ooh. yeah, man, congrats. I can't even remember. I don't remember if Sean won before or not. <laughs> we do, we, they're, they're honestly totally random, uh, but he's he's definitely a regular. So here's another another Texas. Edinburgh. Ah, good to see Texas well represented here. We have, we have a lot of, lot of Texans coming on here. I think that's uh, that's probably everybody's biggest state for uh, like Facebook likes and that kind of stuff. I think our, ours is Texas. I just to go check out Texas, Florida, and California are always the top three. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in Idaho, Utah, nice. So I think we're gonna get right into this. Oh nope, he didn't. First time winner, sweet. So. Um, we're gonna we're gonna try to be easy with this because we are all at some at some point we're we're guilty of some of these things, but you know obviously there are some that are more serious than others. But I think that it it can it can be a problem, and I, the four of us have kind of been talking back and forth right before this and in the past week or so, just bouncing off ideas and pet peeves that we have, and Jacob sent a list of <laughs> of things and. Um, but but we, we we see a lot more of this stuff on a regular basis because of the stories that we write about, and you know we're out there searching for news articles, and people send us stuff all the time. So we see, I think we see a lot more than the average person. Um, so uh, Jacob, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, like when I say to you, stupid gun owner slash negligent gun owner, kind of mix them together. Like what? What's the biggest pet peeve you think you have in that category? Well, for me, it's probably because I'm on the range a lot with students, and so my biggest like <laughs> my biggest pet peeve is the I've been shooting my whole life. Uh, shooting my uh, I've been shooting my whole life is a big one because I think that there's a tendency, and it's partly because we're a relatively male dominated you know industry, and we all care about our ego, and none of us want to look bad or feel bad. And so, you know, going to the range and saying, hey, you know, I've been shooting my whole life is a way of saying like, hey, I'm not clueless. Don't treat me like I'm an idiot. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be out of place here. I, I should be part of the, of the cool club. But it's almost always code for you don't even know how to hold a handgun um, because people have been shooting their whole lives. Like, am I wrong? Like, like I've no, been shooting my whole life. So. It's code for 
I, I've shot shotguns and and bolt action rifles, um, and and that's 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 like you know I've been hunting. I've done some. I've shot some clay pigeons. Um, <laughs> My you know, buddy I has know, a 1022. I know that, like, right, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course I have a Ruger 1022. And Listen, I, Jacob, I definitely had BB guns too. Obviously, you know? obviously you have a higher clientele than I do because I don't hear that as much as I hear I grew up around guns. That's the one that I love. I grew, yeah. It's not even right. shooting my whole life, but I grew up around guns. But, yeah, I, 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 but all of these, all of these sayings, I think what they're getting at, though, is there are a lot of people who are comfortable with firearms and it's firearms have been a part of the household setting at least mm -hmm. to a great extent but going from that to somebody who's diligently carrying a handgun which i think is probably what we're all talking about mainly when we talk about stupid gun owners and it's really nothing to do with being stupid as much as being negligent with that gun um two different things you know people who yeah. grew up like um uh, Jacob was talking about bolt action, shotguns. A lot of people come from a hunting environment, a rural mm -hmm. environment, etc. That does not translate to making the commitment to carry a handgun every day at all. I, I always it, get the feeling that when somebody says, I, I grew up around guns or I'm uh, – Jacob, what, what was it that you said? Oh, I've been shooting my whole life. I mean, yeah, I've been shooting my whole life. Um, they don't – they don't – they never seem very open to uh, – and, and anything, training, criticism, um, well, constructive you, you just, criticism, the, you know. Yeah, you hit it on the head. Like, that's the point, right? The, the, what's stupid about the person who says that? And, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with saying that because it's, 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 if it's a true factual statement, then I shouldn't jump down your throat and it shouldn't be a pet peeve of mine, right? But the problem is that often the reason it's being said or what it's a sim symbol of is, is ego and pride. And ego and pride have no business on a gun range, no matter who you are, right? Like, it. <laughs> one has to accept a certain degree of vulnerability in order to a be safe and b learn. So if I'm going to learn and grow as a shooter, and if I want to, uh, you know, be safe and exercise caution, then I have to accept a certain degree of vulnerability. So, so you can call it humility or you can call it vulnerability. You can call it healthy confidence, but, but ego uh, has, has no place on a gun range. Yeah. So I just put up Ron's comment from yeah. Facebook. And, and, and again, everybody, when we say I, I, it just it's more, you know, more provocative and whatever. We're like, are you a stupid gun owner? Um, you know, we're, we're more talking about negligence here. We're not you know, we're not. I mean, some of the people are, are just downright stupid. Let's be honest. But, um, you know, we're not we're not portraying that. And we're not saying that you guys are stupid, anything like that. We're not saying we're stupid. We all make mistakes. Um, we're, we're all negligent sometimes, I think. Um, you know, it's a, it's a constant thing that we work on, but so he says that his neighbor money is, says my neighbor shot himself cleaning his gun. Uh, I said to him, how did that happen? He said he dropped the magazine and Thank forgot you. there was one in the chamber and I've, I've heard the story before. Um, he went to slide it back after cleaning the outside slipped and the hammer made contact. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's, that's a rule, right? Like no ammo in the room yeah. when you're cleaning a gun. Do you, you guys follow that? I, I, I do. I do. Though I'll, I'll admit I have had a negligent discharge. Like I, I, cannot, I cannot say that I've never had an ND before because I've had one. Was it uh, – do you care to elaborate? Like was it a range setting? Sure. Was it no, no. I was, uh, I, was, I was a punk kid. I was 19 years old. And I thought I was James Bond, probably, and um, came home one day, and, and uh, the the garage door was open. And I'm sure I I probably left it open, right? But I I didn't know, so I decided I had to go all Jason Bourne on the house, right, and check it out, uh, because that's what you do when you're 19 and awesome. And uh, <laughs> so I, I grabbed a gun, you know, a handgun. It was oh, you'll love this. It was my 45 ACP High Point, and uh, I owned three high points at that time. All my handguns were high points. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'd i like checked the whole house. Like I knew what I was doing. And I got to the, the end of the house. Of course, there was no one there. And here's where the ND happens. Uh, that particular gun, I can't remember the round count, but let's say it was like seven in the mag and one in the chamber, you know, seven round guns. So I basically just counted wrong. Like I decided it was cooler uh, 
um, to empty the gun by cycling the slide repeatedly. Like this, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, this is this is right. So it's just like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, whatever. And I was just counting like pop up and you know the the, the rounds are coming out and I think onto like a, a mattress of a bed right there as is the last room I was in and I was like clear, you know, and then I just like just dry fire press the trigger uh, of the gun just to release the you know just I don't know why because it was cool I don't know maybe I saw it in a movie I was I was clueless guys like completely clueless. And um, the, the good news, perhaps, is that I, I, I lit the round off into a mattress. Now, mattresses don't stop bullets, so it obviously you know, did some zoom, 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 zoom around in, in the concrete basement where I was, but didn't hit me, didn't hit anything, it didn't break anything. Uh, it was extremely loud, 45 ACP on a high point, no ear protection in a concrete oh. you know, basement. Yeah. Um, so I froze. Like, I didn't move for a good yeah. 10 seconds, right? Like, just... Just like, and then, and then you, when you start moving, you start shaking. You're like, oh my gosh. So yeah, I, I learned a very important lesson the hard way. You know, it would be nice if most people could learn it the easy way. <laughs> that's that's why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. with, uh, well, actually, let me, let me put this up here first because this is kind of backtracking a little bit to what you were talking about. Um, Tommy says, I agree that ego has no place on the range and we must be open to criticism. The same rule applies to instructors. I've seen the case. I've seen the same characteristics in some of them even more so. Um, and I've, and I, I've seen instructors do things that were uh, not I, my experience, not like terrible, terrible, but still things that they would normally teach people not to do. And, uh, you know, like uh, flagging, and you know, I, I think, like I said, we all we all do it uh, or have done it, um, and it's just a matter of you know what are, what are we doing to correct that. And I, I wanted to talk quick about the maybe not quick because it's a big it's one of the biggest things for me, and I literally just did it is leaving a gun in the car when you're not in the car. So last night my uh the alarm on the jeep goes off at 2 a.m and i had i had a handgun locked in the center console and i never leave it there overnight or if i'm not in the car and it was just it was a crazy day and there were a thousand things going on i didn't forget it was there but i was more like okay i have all this stuff going on it can stay there for a little bit it'll be fine um Maybe that wasn't exactly the train of thought, but I just, there wasn't enough thought in my head about that particular thing to say, okay, I need to go out there and get it. So nothing happened. I don't know why the alarm went off. I have no idea. But, um, you know, if somebody was breaking into the car, even though the center console is locked, I mean, you know, it's one of the standard center consoles with that stupid little lock on it. And if you, you know, you got adrenaline going, you rip that thing open pretty uh, consistently, I would think, without, without too much struggle. Um, what do you, what do you guys think about, uh, leave people, people who leave on a regular basis, a car in the gun, a car in the gun, a gun in the car. I was, I was going to say like a, like a truck gun, truck gun. Yeah. The, the statistics speak for themselves. The vast majority of guns that are stolen are stolen out of vehicles every year, you know, and they end up in the hands of criminals on the black market. You know, a lot in, in pawn shops, I'm sure, too. But um, when 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 criminals break into a house or a vehicle, you know, they're looking for valuables. Guns are always one of the, the top valuables that they're looking for. So even some of the solutions for locking your handgun up in the vehicle, man, there's few and far between that are really that that effective. You know, it's, it's better than nothing, but... Um, I've seen a lot of incidents of guys using a small hand safe with the Kensington cables, you know, wrapped around yeah. something. A guy who's got a, a wire cutter or bolt cutter I in his pocket, those. man. Yeah, he, yeah, he'll have that thing out of there in three seconds, you know. So it's very precarious. Um, I, I think if we all want to be honest, there's times it's going to happen. We're going to leave a gun in the vehicle. You might be out running errands and all of a sudden uh, you get a call, you know, honey, stop at the post office, whatever. Right, you weren't planning on having to disarm, but you're going to do it. You're going to leave the gun in the vehicle because you have to go into a restricted area. So, 
I think reality being what it is, it's going to happen for most people from time to time. But making it a habit, you're you're just asking. You're just asking for it. You know, that's that's one of the reasons I'm really pretty much opposed to the whole trunk gun idea. You know, not only is it the idea of having a rifle in your trunk, are you... Ne- you're never going to get to it on time to use for anything realistic to begin with. Uh, but, you know, most guys are not carrying the rifle in and out to the car every day. It's going to stay in that car. You know, and unless you have a really significant way to secure that thing in the trunk, it, it's going to walk off eventually. So that that's my two cents. I'm, I'm in a, uh, we're in a... We're in a nice neighborhood here. And about two years ago... Same same place. The Jeep was broken into, and I think I actually left it unlocked. Um, and it was again. It was one of those weird days. I wasn't fully paying attention to everything that I was doing, and like I always always lock the car every time. And this time, well, not every time. <laughs> this time I didn't. And and it was broken into. There were no guns in there, but you know they went and went through some stuff, and it was probably a couple of kids or something like that. But. Um, you know, luckily there wasn't anything like that in there. They got away with, I think, like two bucks and change, and think think that was about it. Because I don't I don't leave anything of value in the car. Uh, so, just a reminder. I've seen a lot of good comments, and and any of you guys, Dan, Jacob, Sal, if you see any comments uh, that you want me to highlight, just let me know. Um, I've been trying to keep up with them, but. What is this? The only time I ever leave my gun locked in my car is if I'm going to some place with a metal detector. I've heard, I've heard that a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. Um, the other places that you really have to watch out, and Sal mentioned this is the post office. Yeah. Uh, Anything or any federal. Other federal building. Yeah. yeah. It's a one thing house. to walk into a, like here in Texas, they have 30 out six signs that you can't carry a concealed gun. And if you do, oh, right. it's no big deal. But federal property you don't mess with. That's a felony. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah losing your right to That's... vote would suck. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone your gun rights for the rest of your life. Right. And... right. That'd, that'd be a bad day. Yeah, I, I'm guilty of this one too, day. by the way. I, I definitely, there was a time when I had a truck gun and it, you know, I'm, I think, I think the most common things we see, well, I'll give you three and I think all three are concerning, but I think everyone has to kind of go through this journey. Right. But, but one is the truck gun, this idea that oh, I want the big gun in the truck so I can fight to it. And uh, I, I, I was, I had to overcome that one. I thought it was sounded like a good idea at one time. Another one I think we see a lot is this idea that, uh, well, carrying a gun on my body is hard or uncomfortable or whatever. So I'm going to have a gun in the car and I'm going to go to the house and I'll put guns places where I need them. And then I'll have one with me all the time. And that's a huge fallacy. I think it's just completely ridiculous. We could talk about that sometime, uh, but that's a disaster. But the third, and this is the one that I think is the most concerning to me and maybe the stupidest of our list, you know, on, on this one. It's the people who get in the car and transfer a gun off from body to car holster uh, with, <laughs> under the premise, the, the theoretic idea that, A, that's somehow better, and, and B, that when they get out of the car, they'll remember to transfer it back. And, and in all of this administrative handling, there will never be a negligent discharge. So right, because that, that's, that's my biggest this, one. Because most of them are doing this from a seated position. Right, yeah. right. You know? yeah, probably flagging themselves as they go, probably putting it into right. some holster system where when the car gets in a car crack, the, the, the gun's going to go who, who knows where. It, it's some theoretic idea that I'll be able to get this gun faster than I would have on my waist, but now i got to remember two different draw strokes. Like The whole thing is, 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 a, is a bad idea for lots of reasons, mm-hmm. uh, but it's we, – we, I mean, I know companies that sell a large number of car holsters, so people are buying them. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's a whole other topic as far as I'm concerned, because there there are a lot of companies out there that, you know, th- this is a different industry. I mean, you can you can sell people garbage with other, you know, stupid stuff. But when you sell people and I'm not saying I'm not saying specifically the car holsters necessarily, but uh, you sell people garbage in the gun industry where you're, you know, opening people up to things like negligent discharges and and whatnot uh i think is is a it's a whole other topic but mark says cop neighbor left his handgun in a car overnight doors unlocked and someone checking doors took it uh we have a lot of door checkers making the 3 a.m rounds and that's what people do like they'll just 
they'll walk around a neighborhood and just pop just the doors. Pop yep, and just right. to, yeah. Everyone opens, that's the one they're going into. They don't want to mess around with trying to actually get into a car. Yeah, they with the noise of smashing a window or something like that. Right, right, exactly. So, you know, in the vast majority of cases, if the car is locked, windows are up, you're probably not going to have any problem, but it's still not a reason to keep your gun in the car. <laughs> yeah, and as far as the uh, putting a, a, a gun specifically in the car when you get in the car, I think if, if, you're, if your holster system is so uncomfortable, you can't wear it while you're driving, you really need to change the way you carry. Um, you know, and if, if you do need to occasionally at least disarm and leave it in the car, like Jacob was talking about the administrative handling of it. it. When you're distracted, running errands, probably running late, running late for work, whatever the case may be, you're really setting yourself up to torch one off <laughs> when you don't want to. Uh, if you have to arm and disarm in the car a lot, use a holster that the whole holster can come off the waistband. Okay, Use a yeah. holster with clips or loops so that the whole package comes off together goes in your console or wherever you can lock it temporarily, then the whole package goes back on. I, I'll admit if if I have errands to run where I know I'm going to have to enter gun-free zones, I'll actually carry a, a gun that's different than my usual carry gun specifically for that reason. Usually I'll carry a revolver in a holster that's very fast and easy to get on and off. Revolver in general is very safe for administrative handling, but the whole thing stays in its holster to go in and out while I'm doing that kind of thing throughout the day. So you really need to think about that. If, if you have the gun unholstered in the car for any reason, especially a striker-fired gun, it's, it's just a matter of time you could really have an accident that you don't want to have. It's a really bad idea. Yeah, and It's easy to forget that. My problem is that I forget. So I'll go to the post office and I'll disarm myself and leave the, in the car. And then when I get back in, I just drive off and I'll forget that I didn't put it mm -hmm. back in my, you know, on my hip. And then the car, it ends up sitting in the center console and, oh, my God, you know, I left a gun in the car. So thank you, U.S. government. It, it's very point. easy to do, yeah. yeah. And it, because, you know, for, for people like us who actually carry all the time, that's the standard mode of operation is that you're carrying. So it's very easy to, to not remember, oh, I, I took it off. You know, for most people, having yeah, it on is, right. is the novelty. For us, it not being on is the novelty. And, and that just shows you that you get so used to it, you don't feel it. You know, so you just don't. It, it, I, I've had times where I've come in at 5 o'clock into the house and 10 o'clock at, at night, I realize yeah. my gun is not on because exactly. I had to take it off enter somewhere yeah yep, so been there. yeah let me uh you know put a put a couple of these comments up here seth is telling us about his mishap 10 years ago with my first pistol and quote showed off and then his friend's friend stole it from the house when he went to the bathroom i went outside <laughs> with a, with a broadsword and got called crazy. He got arrested. Never found the gun. Um, I mean that. So that's like that's man, a story. These, these, well, these are all. Any I'm reading through all these comments, and we could do entire shows on just these specific <sighs> things. Um. So so where do you guys think that falls under? Like the whole. Uh, First of all, don't show off your guns. Well, I'm not going to say show off. I'll say so. Let's 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 put this into like a big circle of, um, you know, you post a picture of your gun on Facebook, and some you know people are like, well, it's only my friends, and you know, no big deal. Uh, I've I've done a lot of stories on that where somebody will post a picture, hey, got this new handgun, and they might have like a hundred friends on Facebook, and they you know they know them all very well, and all of this. But, you know, they have a one of one of those friends has another friend looking over their shoulder when they're looking at this, find find the name, look it up or whatever. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, they're breaking into your house. What do you what do you guys think about that? I mean, how many how often do you see a sticker in the back of a truck window shouts like this dude has guns, follow him home for sure. Yeah. And you'll find a house right. with guns in it. Right. Um, I see those all the time or even things that are more like 
we could go down a rabbit hole. Like I could argue that yeah. if I see someone wearing camouflage, anything, the hoodie, the hat, right? Like the, someone who's a veteran, like veteran oh, yeah. of whatever war, like odds are pretty dang good. They got guns in their house. Yeah. Certain t-shirts. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, this all plays to, you know, keeping a low profile being, you know, that proverbial gray man, the, the thing right. of the advertising like that. Um, <laughs> I saw a guy one time uh, come out of the coffee shop and he's wearing five eleven pants, five eleven jacket. Um, you know, I could tell immediately he's carrying. And then he, he goes to his car and he's got a gun sight sticker on his car. He's got a <laughs> Glock sticker, everything, you know, and, and again, a lot of people will say, oh, nobody knows what that is. No, the no. cops and bad guys know what that is. And yeah. I always remind people of that. The the people you don't want knowing that mm -hmm. know it. You know, cops and bad guys know it. You know, so do you want to get hassled by law enforcement? And do you want to get, uh, far worse, targeted by the criminal element because they want to steal something or, or take something? You know, having that stuff all over your vehicle is, is again, really setting yourself up for, for a break. And there's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to pop around a little bit and then I'm going to ask you guys if you have uh, what else comes to mind. Garland says, uh, let's see, first handgun when he was 28, moved from Canada, lived in Connecticut, California, then finally gun-friendly Tennessee. I am meticulous in cleaning my gun every single time I pick it up. Clearing. Oh, clearing. I'm like, yeah. I'm like he cleans it every time he picks it up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, clearing. Doesn't matter if I put it down and come back and pick it up again minutes later, I always clear. I hope I never have a negligent discharge. And I, I do the same thing. Like if I had one right here and, you know, checked it and it was clear, set it down. And even if I don't walk away and I pick it up again, I'm just like, it takes a second, literally mm -hmm. just a second. Um, and there were a couple of, maybe a month ago, there was this video that was floating around to these, these two or three guys that were in this, uh, looked like an office and they just come back from the range and they were, they were finished cleaning their guns and then they were just being, I mean, completely irresponsible and negligent and um, messing with each other in, in their own way and like pointing pointing their guns at each other. And the one guy ends up, he pulls the trigger thinking that it was unloaded. And while he's pointing it at his friend and shoots yeah. him and he dies. And, you know, I'm like, I mean, that's, that's a pretty extreme example. But, you know, that guy... I, I don't believe he meant to do that. Was he an idiot? Yeah, absolutely. Was he stupid? Yeah, negligent, of course. Um, but I, but I think that he just he was in that uh, that mindset of nothing bad's gonna happen. I know, I know guns. You know, been around them my whole life, <laughs> and I know that this gun is not loaded. You know, not even mentioning the fact that he pointed it at his friend, but. Um, you know, how do you get people out of that mindset? Well, I mean, this harkens back to, you know, Jeff Cooper, who, who codified the, the four rules of gun safety. And if you look at the way he wrote it originally, rule one was all guns are always loaded. It wasn't treat guns like they're loaded or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's all guns are always loaded. Right. And if, if you put that into your mind what what that means and and the reason that's rule one is that everybody think about all of the negligent discharges that uh, stories you've heard of whether it's just somebody you know shooting a hole in their wall or something tragic like the story you just gave brandon if people do these kind of things it's because they have in their mind a different way to treat a gun when it's unloaded as opposed to when it's loaded so would he have pointed his gun at his friend and pulled the trigger if he thought it was loaded? No, unless he wanted to kill the guy, right? So that's why that's rule one. So the the best thing you can do for yourself is is get into the mindset that all guns are always loaded. There should be no difference in the way you handle the gun, whether it's loaded or not. Um, in training classes we've done, we don't even point blue guns at people unless we're doing like force on force stuff to specifically do that. Because if we're teaching gun handling, even the blue guns, 
Right. And I'll explain to people that it's it's so deeply ingrained in my mind that I can't even bring myself casually to point this fake blue gun at you. Right. Why? Because there is only one mindset. All guns are always loaded. And if you get that into your mindset, you won't have a tragedy. Now, no guarantee you won't have a negligent discharge. Because if you shoot all your life and you put hundreds of thousands of rounds down range, you may very well have a negligent. There's those who have had and those who will. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between a negligent discharge and, you know, torching one off into a safe backstop and torching one off into somebody who you did not want to shoot. Two different things. So if, if you rely on that first rule of gun handling, it's going to avoid a lot of problems. Get into your mind that there's only one way to treat a gun whether it's loaded or not. So think of something like dry firing. You are intentionally pulling the trigger, pressing the trigger of the handgun, right? Practicing in your house with it dry. If you torch one off, make sure you're doing it in a way that the bullet is going to go somewhere, that it's not going to leave the house, that it's not going to hit anything that is valuable, whether it's life or, you know, don't shoot your $5,000 television either. You know, the biggest downside should be probably your spouse giving you hell for a couple of weeks after yes. there's a really loud <laughs> noise in the house, right? So if we want to be realistic, the idea that you will never have a negligent discharge, I, I don't, I don't, most people who spend their whole life doing a lot of shooting, you may have one. You're very likely you'll have one, but you'll have one that doesn't hurt anybody. And, and that's the big difference. I, I'm not saying that to act casual about it. Oh, not, you know, negligent discharge, no big problem, not at all. But the difference is even if you make the mistake, oh, I thought it wasn't loaded, uh, maybe you're dry firing, and, and this happens a lot. Somebody gets distracted, gets on a phone call, reloads the gun, goes back to dry firing, bang. Yeah. Okay. But if all the other practices are right, if the gun is pointing towards that safe backstop again, you're probably going to uh, get hell from uh, your family members for a couple of weeks. Yeah. But that's it. What about uh, what about this one? And I've seen this before, and it was at a range. This guy brought his buddy for the first time. Uh, so let's see. He or she says, when shooting a while back with friends – friend handed a foreign student a loaded pistol, which the student had never handled a gun before and was swinging it around, and I had to disarm him, literally scared the shit out of me, but it was a split second, and I got the gun away. Um, like I said, I've seen this happen uh, twice. You know, the one that I remember more is the, uh, the friend brings his friend to the range, and I mean, I don't know what they talked about ahead of time, but basically like here's the gun and it's loaded so go for it the first thing this guy does is so the magazine was in but there was no round in the chamber doesn't matter right but anyway um first thing he does is he uh he flags his friend like because he's trying to look at the sights and he's pointing it right at his friend's gut and his fingers on the trigger all this stuff and, you know, it's at that point, I, I, I just left. I have to leave. And, you know, a range officer went over to them and I, who knows I, if they were kicked out or what. But um, imagine stuff like that happens often. Um, so how do, how, do you guys, how do you guys handle stuff like that? Like with even if you go to the range with someone who's, who's a very proficient shooter and they're like, hey, you know, mind if I try your, your gun? Uh, how do you how do you give them that gun? Well, I, I've been in this. I mean, treat, I'm not an instructor. I'm not a full time instructor or anything like that. But I've taught a lot of people to shoot and taken novices to shoot. And before they ever touch a gun, we go through the four rules every mm -hmm. time. And I make mm -hmm. them say them back to me. And you know, I, they have to know that what those rules are. And, that, and number one, keep that keep that gun pointed in a safe direction at all times. So if you have some foreign guy who's never touched a gun and you just hand it to him and say, here, there you go, you have to expect something like that to happen almost. Um, he has no idea. He doesn't know what safe gun handling is. Um, so if you go shooting with somebody who who you're not familiar with, they may say they're comfortable with guns. They may be shooting. They may say, 
um, you know, I grew up with guns. You know, I've been yeah. around guns all my life. I'm still going to go through the four rules with them because I don't know them. Uh, right. I don't know them from Adam. And the last thing I want is uh, somebody lasering me. Right. So if you, what a lot if, of people may not realize um, is that the professionals in this industry, like guys like us, when we go to an event with just other professionals, there's still safety briefings. Yes. <laughs> Every I, time. I, 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 I've never in my life gone to a range with a bunch of pros and had right. everybody be like, we don't need to talk about safety, right? We're good. Like that's never happened. Right, ever. Right, right. And right. anybody who's taken a lot of professional training with the high speed, low drag guys will tell you the first hour of any class, you might go to a class that's three days long. The first hour is going to be going over the four rules of safe gun handling. Okay. It is that simple. And you know, uh, the guy who explained it the best, I, I first heard it, I think it was Clint Smith from Thunder Ranch, and he goes way back, right? He was one of the original old guard guys, you know, with, with Jeff Cooper and all that. Um, he explains that those four rules are for fighting. They're not just administrative gun handling. There's nothing you will do with a gun in your hand that those four rules are not in, in play. Think about a guy in a stack in a SWAT team about to kick down a door. Is it good if he's got his finger on the trigger pointing at the back of his buddy's head? Absolutely not. So those those four rules of gun safety are universal, whether you're in a gunfight or you're just shooting at the range. Uh, as far as the brand new shooter thing goes, when I train people, if it's my preference, I mean, you know, is concealed carry class or, or just teaching people at the range, whatever the case may be. But if it's let's say it's my preference and somebody who's never even fired a handgun says, hey, can you teach me and maybe me and a few friends as long as it's a fairly small group, my preference is to spend about three hours of just dry work with that person or those people before we even go to the range. Okay, the manipulation of the gun, a lot of dry firing before we even fire a round. And, and that way you can really start to instill at least the initial safety of it. The other thing I would uh, recommend, so for anybody listening to this who you – whether you train people from time to time or just take people to the range. If you have a brand new shooter, only put one round in the magazine the first few times they take a shot because I've seen it too many times. Some people have a reaction where they literally act like uh, a firecracker explodes in their hand. Yeah. And they'll drop the gun. Yep. They'll freak out. They'll turn around with it. Put one. Put only one. And then you can judge – the individual you know uh okay yeah. they're having no problem with this then you can step it up from there but the first few rounds they fire put just one round in that magazine so that that's, you can kind of judge how they're going to react yeah that, that's an excellent point i'm glad you brought that up because I've, I've done that with every single person that i've ever taught how to shoot and and sometimes it's you know it's one 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 and then and then no you're like okay let's you know we can put a little more in there and sometimes mm -hmm. you do it mm -hmm. 10 15 times just so they can you know, get get used to it because you see like, okay, maybe, you know, it's still a little flinchy or the reaction is a little different. They need to get more acclimated to it. Um, I, I want to bounce back really quickly to the, in, in the car, keeping a gun in the car. And, and I, I don't mean to throw this guy under the bus, Kirk. Um, oh, actually he's, no, he, okay. So he was responding to somebody else on there, but um, so he, he has a gun safe, uh, let's see, passenger seat, he, it has a code, he can use it without looking. The safe is steel cabled to my seat frame. That's, that's the key point here, okay? Uh, my seat frame is all welded together, so if they break into my car, they have to unbolt the seat, uh, so and so. Um, if I'm understanding it correctly, if, that, if that's one of those steel cables that's attached to the seat, um, you know, some, some simple cutters, you know, you, you clip that cable. Most of those are, what, what are they like? Uh, $25 bolt cutters will go right through them. Right. But I mean, the, the, the size of those, the standard cables that I see on those types <laughs> of, I mean, they're, they're very, they're very thin. Yeah. Like they're, a little more than a quarter inch, something like that. Maybe so half an inch. Yeah, I sell three or four different types in our in our warehouse. I got the Gun Vault Universal one and a couple others, and there, there's not much to them. Though I, I I would applaud this commenter, right? Like if you're gonna have a gun safe in the car, and all of us have said that we're sometimes in situations where we gotta lock up a gun in a car temporarily, right? That's so it sounds like, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I, I I too have a safe 
cabled <laughs> to my car seat. Yep. I just don't leave a, a gun in it all the time, right? You don't leave it uh, there. So, right. That's that's, and I don't know Kurt who made this comment. I don't know if you what you're how you're referring to it, but I think you did a great job. Is my point like awesome? Yes. Like not poo pooing on you at all. Because all of us sometimes have to leave a gun in the car, and if we're going to do that, let's have it the most secure we can make it. And good work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nine out of ten thieves won't have that bolt cutter in right. their pocket, right? right. And, and right. they don't want to spend a lot of time. So it's going to dissuade nine out of ten guys who are going to break into that car. So absolutely, that's the way to do it. If you do have to even occasionally leave a gun in the car, there's no, there's no um, doubt about that. We have to be realistic to the point where we have to acknowledge, okay, even your big gun safe in your house, if you get the right people who come in, they will get into that. Yes, they right. Will. The difference is, you know, it's one in a thousand who's going to be equipped or skilled enough to do it, right? So, but there's always the possibility that you get somebody who could indeed get get into it. Uh, so we 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 play the probabilities, you know, when we do any of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see. We had uh, Jacob. I'm taking this from your list too. Is uh, forgetting your gun is in your carry-on bag while you're going through security at the airport. Yeah. And I've had three students have to retake my class by court order because they left a gun in their carry-on luggage. And they and apparently that's a common thing that uh, is, is, is part of a plea deal. Uh, you did dumb gun thing, great, go retake safety class. So I've had three times a student call me up and say, I got to retake your class, Jacob. Why? Oh, I left my gun in the carry on bag when I hit the airport. I saw Brad. I know somebody did that. And so it yeah, goes yeah, back to the, goes back to the post office. He had to disarm himself and he put it in an interior pocket in his backpack when he went in the mm -hmm. post office and he forgot. And the next day he was flying. And he grabbed his backpack and forgot what gun was in there, and he put it on the uh, the uh, the conveyor belt. And all of a sudden, sir, is this your bag? That was it. So, yeah. so what was? Do you know what the outcome was with that? Yeah, fortunately, he lives here in Texas and had a concealed carry permit, so he was not arrested. Um, but. Uh, you you open yourself up to uh, a pretty big fine from uh, TSA. Oh, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And, and everybody listening, Texas is is one of the exceptions because a lot of the states you you will very much be arrested. Yes, <laughs> if you if you do mm -hmm. that, you yeah. still yeah, carry absolutely. permit or not. You know, one suggestion I can give with that is. Um, any bags that I keep, and not just guns. I'm not big on guns and bags. Um, I like the gun on person, but I might have spare mags, knives, that kind of thing in a bag. I typically don't fly with any bags that I do that. Now, guys who do, one of the suggestions I've heard that really works well is, let's say you have a backpack or any kind of bag that you just travel with all the time. The bag contains weaponry a lot of the time. Have a designated smaller bag that goes in there that is your do not fly bag so uh, and, and in fact they sell things like velcro it says do not fly right a patch you can put on that little pouch let's say you keep a gun and magazines or knives or whatever all the stuff that you can't take on the airplane put in that do not fly pouch and that way it's going to make it much easier for you when you're packing your load out to go jump on a flight to remember oh yeah that cannot that cannot go along. So yes. yeah, I thought that was an interesting tip. Good idea. Yeah, yeah, Jacob. Yeah, I've never heard that before. I like that. Jacob, this comment's for you. I'll let you read it. From Seth, Jacob, never seen him before, but my girlfriend has been listening to your podcast and your articles. I've never, but I feel you're teaching her the correct things, and she's never touched a gun at 28 yet. Well, if she's listening to my podcast and she's never touched a gun yet, then uh, that is bizarre. <laughs> But, but thank you. I'll take I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> no, that that's cool. Um, hey, I, I, real quick, just for fun, I looked up uh, the TSA website because they they do a really good job actually of publishing data. And last year, 2019, 4,432 firearms were discovered in carry-on bags. Um, 2020 is 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 pacing really high. In fact, it's specific to July, they said in 2020 they found 15.3 guns per million people. 
compared to the previous year in July, 5.1 guns per million people. So it's like up 300% year over year. Yeah, everybody's scared. Everybody's tooling up. Yeah, that's very strange. You know, when you get a lot fewer people flying this now, year. I wonder why... Yeah. I wonder why it's so so much higher. Yeah, I don't understand the, why the um, rate would be up. People, uh, I'll tell you what. So so it's the percentage, right? Uh, so right. there's fewer people flying, but like you say, it's three hundred more of a yeah. So you know, if people are flying to, let's say, for work to a for uh, to a uh, different city, and you're worried about civil unrest breaking out, people are going armed, and they're forget <laughs> they're either not realizing you can't actually take your gun on the plane. I don't know what kind of rock right. you'd have to be living under to think that, but well, I you think, know, I think you should have a lot more a lot more new gun owners too, right? Like just this year, mm -hmm. right? you know, if we're talking about July 2020. Um, I mean, let me ask you guys something. When you when you started your gun owning life, and and for me, it was as an adult, like. Really, like I, I didn't own a gun until I was 18 and really didn't get serious about it until I was about 21. Um, how long did it take you to get a range bag, like where you put your gun stuff? Like for how long were you just grabbing the, a backpack and pulling your other crap out and throwing your range gear in it? I know for me, I did that for years. And I think that it takes a while maybe for someone to get like into the mode of like dedicated bag. Like this mm. is this is my plane bag. This is my range bag. Like they're not the same. Yeah. I, I don't know. So so I had I, I actually got started with uh, with everything later than you did, um, but I had I just happened to have a bag that's very much like a range bag, and so I, I started using it immediately. But if I didn't have it, it probably would have been a couple of years realistically. Yeah, you know, and again, one of the benefits of that practice is if you do travel. You know, even just a round of ammo that gets lost in that bag can jack you up when that goes through the, the detectors, just the, you know. You're, the, the, yeah. the, the presence of the lead, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, uh, they can sense the uh, residue, the uh, gunpowder residue. In fact, yeah. I was going with my whole family through um, <laughs> through uh, the airport one time, and uh, one of my child's car seats came out of my car. And all of a sudden, the TSA guys are acting weird when they're scanning the car seat. <laughs> and um, the one guy pulls me aside. He's like, sir, there's gunpowder residue on the car seat. I was like, well, I'm a competitive shooter. And that came out of my car. I, the guy was cool about it. He's like, oh, yeah, what do you shoot? Yeah, I have a Beretta, you know, whatever. Uh, so it worked out fine. But even that, yeah. I learned after that, if I'm flying on a long trip where I had to take the car seats, I would wipe the car seats down. If they were car seats that came out of my my car, we we just stopped using anything from my car. We would always use for my wife's vehicle, you know. But mm -hmm. if that's how sensitive those sensors are. So, yeah, it, it's it is your uh, your gun lifestyle and the TSA are not are not buddies. They're not compatible. They're just not. How how about this one? And we talked about this before, not on here, but uh, earlier. For getting a gun in a public bathroom. <laughs> so, well, it, it, comment anybody. I I keep a running list of news stories where this has happened, um, on, on a on a specific place on our on concealedcarry.com just just for fun so that if anyone ever's like you know does this happen all the time like here's the list you know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I'm doing it since like 2013 or something, and um, it happens more than you think. It it, yeah. it, it really does, mm -hmm. and and frankly, the the most common place uh, I see it happen when I check a news story is cops. Yes, uh, yeah. it's cops that'll do it um, all the time, and I think it's the nature of the the way that a duty rig rolls and a duty belt and some things like that. But but all that aside, um, I definitely know I have friends who've been guilty of this. Um, and, and I have almost forgotten a gun in a public bathroom at least once. And I did once forget one in a hotel. So all my, all my dirty secrets Ow. are coming out tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was terrifying. So, uh, <laughs> here, I guess would be the, a couple of thoughts for me. One would be, I think the biggest challenge ha that people have is, is a, um, remove, if you carry in such a way that you feel you need to remove the gun from wherever it normally is in order to sit down on the John, um, there's your first challenge. Like maybe you need to make adjustments or get a different holster or something because the ideal scenario here is do nothing, like leave gun where it is. Um, yeah, if you can yeah. figure out a way to pull that off, like all problems resolved. Um, I think the second key here is 
uh, what what Sal- uh, Salvatore was talking about earlier about uh, in the car, like don't don't take gun out of holster, take holster out of pants. If you're if you're gonna remove it, remove it in the holster so we eliminate administrative handling and potential ND issues. But here's the big one when it comes to forgetting, and that is put it somewhere you'll see. Internet just go down. Am I still oh, here? We lost you for just a second. Uh, did we lose him again? Maybe he froze. Jacob, I'll, uh, I'm going to put you down if we can still uh, if you can still hear us, and if you, you if you want to try to restart the browser or, or something like that, go ahead. To continue with what he was saying, though, putting it somewhere where you see it is exactly right. So if you if it has yeah. to come off, put it in your pants. I, I I just don't understand the mentality that would lead you to set it on top of the toilet behind you in a public restroom. I, I, I cannot figure this out, but apparently it happens quite often to to Jacob's point. Yeah. Jacob, you back? He's having problems. I, ho- yeah. I hope so. I, I, I was picking up audio bits, and so I'm, I'm sure you guys finished my comment like super well, and thank you. So did an excellent job. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the, so the public bathrooms, I, 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 I never did that before, but, uh, like you, Jacob, I, I almost did it at a, uh, in a hotel room, left it in one of those safes that was in there and which I don't like those things anyway, but I don't remember the exact circumstances, but, um, I didn't even, I didn't close the door yet. You know, we weren't like out in the parking lot or down the road or anything like that. I was still in the room but i almost left without it like after you did that thing where you're checking okay do we have this 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 and going through everything and like okay we we got everything let's go and you know one foot out the door oh crap the gun is in the safe (laughs) we should probably bring that too yikes yeah yeah you know so one thing over the years and i got good about doing this once i had children i'll admit before i had kids in the house It was kind of haphazard, leaving guns laying around. Um, So, in fact, this has come up on this show before, Brandon. In fact, I remember a couple months ago, one of the shows we were discussing hand saves in the house. And a lot of people were commenting, kind of shocked by how I said that if the gun's not on me, it's locked up, period. It's it's, it's never out. You know, um what I find is even if I did not have children or at the point when my children are grown and I no longer have to worry about it, I still don't think I would go back to having guns outside of safes unless they're on my body. I just, I just don't see it. There's too much that can go wrong. So I I think part of the problem that we see with a lot of this, whether it's forgetting guns in a public restroom, uh, leaving them, absent-mindedly in the car uh, around the house one of the things that can help is program yourself to only leave the gun in certain places for example the house is a great example of that Um, especially if you have children it's especially important but even if not even if you don't have small kids in the house laying on the coffee table is not where a handgun should be it's just not You know, so even if it's places where maybe you're changing in the bedroom, where do you put the gun when you take it off? Uh, You know, you might put it on the bed if you're literally changing and looking right at it and about to put it on. But if not, what maybe you're going to walk around the house. Would you leave it on the bed? That's not optimal. Even Mm -hmm. up on a shelf in the closet is more optimal. So, like, minimize the amount of places that the gun is left aside from being on your person, you know, like, you know. Myself, as an example, if the gun is not on me, it is, you know, this is my carry gun. I, different guns that are specifically staged for home defense somewhere. Again, those I still keep in a quick access safe of some kind. But let's say the carry gun. If the carry gun is not physically on me, where does it get put? And I have about uh, literally only two places where it would be other than on my body. I have a specific safe where it goes. And I have a place where, you know, just when I'm changing, that it gets put just temporarily until I put it back on. And aside from that, it it will not be placed anywhere else in the house. And 
you know, that, that alone can just help start instilling that in your mind. I, I think if you get into that habit, if you don't even leave it laying around in your house, you're probably less apt to put it on the tank of the toilet behind you in a public restroom. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great advice. I try to do that all the time at the house, only, only very, very specific locations where it'll be set down if it's like momentary. And if it's going to be longer than that, it goes in another more permanent specific place. Um, you know, Brendan, I don't know if uh, you were going to bring it up, but the w another place where you see a lot of uh, people, people negligently leaving the gun in the vehicle, not just pertaining to theft, but I'm aware of several incidents where children have accessed the gun left in the vehicle because there's children unattended in a vehicle and mm -hmm. a parent, you know, runs into the store and has a gun in an unlocked, unlocked console or glove compartment. The kid accesses the gun and then there's a tragedy, you know, uh, that, that's another yeah. thing coming back to the vehicle, you know, again, um, putting the gun somewhere where maybe you don't routinely put it there. If you do, especially if you have kids in the car, this is another thing you yeah. have to think about. You know, if it's not on you, it's not truly under your control. Yeah. Two, two, two stories of the last week. I can't remember if I mentioned it earlier, but involving kids, one was uh, three years old. The other, I think was three, two. And the first one, I remember it was, it was the kids. It was his third birthday party. And so all the families over and all of this. And one of the family members was uh, carrying a handgun in his, I think it was a jacket pocket. I don't remember the details, but it fell out of the jacket pocket. And then this oh. three-year-old child found it and shot himself and, and he died. Good and God. then a couple of days ago, there was another one that I think it was just um, the the kid found uh, found the gun just somewhere in some unsecured location in the house. And same same outcome so i mean if, I, I i don't have kids but you know i i hear that the, if, if it's there they're gonna find it oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah guy I, I found he was three years old at the time one of my sons on top of the refrigerator one time i still can't oh, you quite said figure that, yeah. out yeah i can't i still can't figure out the physics of how this actually happened because even i imagine he got onto the counter then up it's it's still, I can't fathom it, but he did. So, you know, if, if you have a child who can make it on top of the refrigerator, and that's actually a location where people will actually put their gun, right. you know, so that maybe you have a gun close, you know, on the main level of the house or whatever the case may be. Uh, again, put it in a quick access hand safe. I don't understand why people are opposed to these things. You can buy them now for like 50 bucks. And I get it. They have batteries and you don't trust it. Keep the key somewhere nearby. Keep it right nearby because at yeah. least if the child makes it to it, he's not going to get. He's not going to have the wherewithal to find the key, open the box. You know, an older right. child might. You know, but not a small kid. Right. So you know, the, this thing of yeah, leaving it around the um, the house. Uh, but you know what? You just brought off the story about the birthday party, the gun falling out of the pocket. That I think is another theme we've not hit on yet. Talking about stupid uh, gun owners again. I don't know if I like like that term. Negligent gun owners. How many incidents have we seen of that? Of people carrying guns in public and the gun falling out and either hurting somebody or somebody gets their hands on the gun after it falls out of someone's. It, it seems like especially pocket carry is notorious for this. Have you guys seen this a lot? Yeah. Uh, that I haven't seen falling out of a pocket. Mm. Well, I've seen a lot of uh, just lack of holster or lack of good holster problem, yeah. right? Like, so just shoving a gun in the pants kind of issue yeah, or some sort of holster that has just zero retention, you know, like yeah. uh, around here, the famous yeah. story, you guys might remember it, but but in, in Denver, people are still talking about is the uh, FBI agent backflip in the nightclub. Yes. Yeah. Gun yeah. falls out on the floor. Yeah. I'm sure everyone saw that one. That's some fun uh, video. So, yeah, I see plenty of those. And uh yeah, got to have some sort of retention and must use holster, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think the pocket thing, I think but probably more often than not, it's there's no holster involved yeah. at all. 
yeah. you know, and uh, it's a small gun and the pocket is pretty loose and somebody sits on a couch and the gun slips out. Um, you know, somebody sitting on a chair, the gun <laughs> slips out and hits the floor, you know, and people are, are just, it shows you how casually some people take it. And I think yes. a lot of it has to do with um, a lot of gun carriers are those people who will only occasionally carry a gun. And it is a very casual thing. They put a small gun in the pocket, whatever the case may be. And I don't see how a person who is carrying every day is just going to manage to lose the gun in that way if it's a routine part of their life. I could be wrong, but right. I, I'm guessing it's it's the people who are those kind of people who, oh, I'm going to that bad part of town, so I'm going right. to wear my gun today. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, oh, I'm just going down to the grocery store a mile down the road. I don't need it like that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, says just going to the to the the bad part of town again. I my uh, I always respond with, "Why would you go to that yeah. place? Like, if you usually <laughs> right. don't carry a gun and you're going somewhere where you say, oh, I better take my gun because I'm going there.' Why are you going? There? Right, right. <laughs> Sean says, "My kid wears glasses. The rule is on your face or in the case." Same for my gun on me or locked up in the safe. Well, I like that. That's a good uh, good illustration. So we have uh, a couple more minutes here. I, I almost feel like we should do a part two of this in a couple of weeks or, <laughs> or something like that because we only we only scratched the surface. Um, just looking through the other comments here. If there's anything else that you guys want to uh, mention in the closing minutes here, any any other pet peeves or things that stick out to you that are – uh, I don't want to say typical, but you know, just things that you see on maybe a semi-regular basis, regular basis that are negligent on the gun owner's part. Well, I'll talk about uh, holsters and belts because we, we started to scratch that, and I am guilty of this one also. I, I get to be guilty of a lot of things, which means I'm allowed to talk about them. This is your night. Um, but it took me a long time to buy a, a belt that would be considered appropriate for strapping a gun to it. And I remember even like hearing people talk about like gun belts and thinking, I don't know what's, what, what's wrong with all these people. Like my crappy, you know, $11 junky leather belt seems to work just fine. I don't know what's wrong with everyone else. So it took me a while to, to figure that out. But I think that the combination of bad belt and or bad holster or both is a really common screw up. And, and I think it's tough because we're asking people to invest a lot of money. That's, that's like the hidden secret, right, that the new gun owner doesn't know is that, by the way, after you buy that four to $800 gun, um, you're going to have to spend like mm -hmm. a crap ton more money buying a bunch of other stuff in order to be a responsible gun owner. Yeah. And uh, that, that $20, um, you know, essentially like sock of a thing with a crappy plastic clip on it does not qualify as a holster. <laughs> um, size it's size literally a sock. I like how you yeah. said that. Yeah, like yeah. They're, they're, they're like socks. It's like. <laughs> the, oh my gosh. So, so I guess that the belt is, is and I'll, I'll talk more about holsters in a minute. And I know you guys have some great in, input on this, but, but belt is one I'm personally guilty of. So I can speak to it very well. Um, you need a good belt. And I think that's, a, that's a common mistake gun owners make. Um, if you're going to use a, a holster, OWB or IWB that clips onto a belt, then have a good belt. Uh, a good belt, A, fits the clip of the holster. So you generally we're talking about a one and a half or one and three quarter inch belt, um, not a half inch or three quarter inch or mm -hmm. one inch belt. Um, so I think that's really critical. I, I also think that we're talking about something that is uh, rigid enough that it's not allowing the gun to sag the pants wherever the gun is. It's like holding it in place and, and, and also distributing the weight in such a way that you're, you know not one spot on your, on your waistline is shouldering all that weight. Huh, shouldering, that's a bad word to use. Uh, anyway, so I think that that's really key. I also think, though, on the flip side, I definitely see people who are wearing belts that are too stiff. Like I see, and I, I won't name names, but I see companies out there selling belts that, you know, you, <laughs> oh, my gosh, like, you know, like you can, they, they'll, I'll see demos, like they put a board on it and they stack like 5 million mm. pounds and they're like, look at this, like still won't, and I'm like, that's that's definitely not going to be comfortable. Like yeah, whoever right. wears that is going to hate their life for sure. So it, it, it's about figuring out the right thing, but but definitely you're going to need a gun belt. And then with holsters, I think there's several criteria and I'll just mention a few and then I'll, I'll, I'll I feel like I've been talking too long, but um, I think we, we talked earlier about retention. 
but I'll say in, in this order, the number one job of a holster is it must fully cover the trigger guard in such a way that nothing can depress the trigger while the gun is in the holster. And so anytime I see someone show up with the nylon sleeve or the neoprene pocket thing that, that it passes for a holster, uh, or most of the apparel-based holsters or some of the other soft material, like a lot of the belly bands and things like this are guilty of um, the material that's covering the trigger guard is not strong or stiff enough to prevent something from getting in there and potentially uh, moving the trigger to the rear. So that's deal breaker number one, and that is extremely scary, extremely dangerous, um, like super not cool. Uh, and, and number two is, and then I'll, then I'll stop talking and let you guys keep talking, but it's one we talked about earlier, and that is retention. The, the, the holster must have some form of retention of the gun, right? I should, I, I do a, I do the jumping jack test. Like I should be able to just do jumping jack and my gun should not come out of the holster at all. Like it should still be in there. And I'm very flexible as to what that can mean. Like I'm not one of those like Kydex only or, or nothing kind of people. I've seen other holsters uh, of various models. And, and methods and hybrids and different things that all th that will pass the test. And so I'm okay with it, but it needs to have retention. Like I should be able to take my holster off my pants and give it a little shake and the gun should not come out. Now, I'm not a crazy like third, third degree retention dude. Like I, I don't, I'm not on duty. I don't wear a badge, but it needs to have some decent retention to the gun. I think those are two of, of several like critical requirements. And this is one of the biggest mistakes I see gun owners make crappy belt, crappy holster. I, I, I was guilty of using a crappy belt for quite a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was a, a good chunk of time before I got an actual, um, you know, sturdy gun belt that was, uh, Jacob, like you were saying, that wasn't as stiff as a board because I've had that kind of belt too. I mean, you know, like we get stuff to review and, uh, you know, you, mm -hmm. you have like a whole plethora of things. But, um, it, I mean, it was probably – six seven years into carrying before i actually had a belt where i was like okay now this is actually good like mm -hmm. in 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 all respects you know it's good it's it's holding everything up it's uh it's stiff yet still has that flexibility and and it's actually made to be a gun belt you know so uh, speaking of gun belts not i don't want to get in holsters right now we got to wrap this up but what do you guys use for gun belts? I use, uh, I'm pulling it off to read the name of it. <laughs> I wrote a review on it like a year ago, but I forget. Oh, it's uh, the it's the Blue Alpha gear. Uh, they're really they're really nice belts. Um, they're typical nylon made, you know, double layer gun belts. Um, and here's the reason I like it. So, first of all, you could these are like 40 bucks they're not that expensive and this one is made with these quick loops okay so there's the famous cobra buckle which all the uh youtube operators insist on wearing for a normal guy who does normal stuff those things are a hassle and oh, i i yeah. frankly yeah I, yeah i frankly see <laughs> so this this belt is very easy you can see that kind of attachment so the end of the belt goes right through it's got very sturdy velcro and the other great thing about belts like this unlike you know traditional belts where you know like have half an inch increments for the eyelet yeah i always find they're either too loose or too tight you yeah. know a belt like this you make any um uh, any size you want and as you can see Okay, the belt is, it's stiff. Like, if you look at it, it's stiff, but it's not so stiff that it's like an iron band being worn, or the, mm -hmm. like a, a, like you're wearing a chastity belt or something, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, some of them are ridiculous, like, uh, and the belt alone will print. Yeah. I don't know if people realize yes, that. Yes. Like, literally, oh. some belts are so thick, the belt alone will print worse than the yeah. gun. So yeah. yeah, a big thumbs up for the the blue alpha gear, and they're not that expensive. It's like forty dollars, or if they're on sale for like thirty five bucks or something. Yeah. I have two of them. I've had them a long time. Use them all the time. Use them daily. It's good to go. Uh, I'm gonna ask Jacob next because he already took his off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I wanted to be cool too. I yeah. to the loser. So. Um, I, I actually re I found this belt about six months ago and I highly doubt I'll ever change. Like I'm, I got a pile of belts I'm not going back to, but this is the foundation belt from EDC belt co. And these guys are 
Well, a they're a small company, but I also think that they they suck at marketing, so no one knows about them. Um, but it, it also they, they also have one of those like low profile like metal you know glide buckles, so you guys can see that. Uh, okay. But here's here's the thing that makes this belt different and unique is that it's 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 the normal like webbing stuff that's stiff where you want it to be. But if I hold it up fully, you might notice that it actually gets thinner right here in the small of the back. So it, it goes from like double double thickness on these two sides where I'm pointing. And then right when you get to the small of the back, it goes back to single layer thickness. So it's meant to be really flexible right at the small of the back, That's but smart. stiff anywhere the gun would be, you know, anywhere from, you know, call it something like, you know, 10 o'clock around to five, five thirty on the belt line, you have stiffness, but you have flexibility right in the very small of the back. Um, and it, it, it's amazing. Like I, I, I did a bunch of tests. This is going to sound really stupid, but this is what happens when you work in the gun industry. But I did a bunch of tests with belts where I would bend over and I would see what would happen to the curvature of the small of the back with the belt. And you guys know exactly what happens. The belt like sticks mm -hmm. out like a sore thumb. It's like someone could drop something into my pants, like a plumber crack style kind of thing. <laughs> but but this 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 is the only belt I've ever found that it has it's stiff where it needs to be stiff, but it's actually very pliable in the one spot I need it to be pliable to be comfortable. So I'm actually really thrilled with this belt. It's like 45 bucks. Um, and and I'm kind of biased because I sell it, but I, 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 I sell like I sell belts from like 40 companies. So I, I, I hope that doesn't make me too biased. So you can buy those at concealcarry.com. <laughs> you can buy them in a lot of places. You can buy them in a lot of places, including concealcarry.com. Now uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to ask you again, what is the name? Um, the, the company is EDC belt co. Um, the guy behind it is Brian Eastridge. He's um He's a fire instructor in Oklahoma City. He's current. He's he's active PD, Oklahoma City PD. But the belt is called the Foundation Belt. Most people think it's Ernest Langdon's belt because uh, Ernest Langdon was kind of the first adopter and promoter of this belt. And you can buy them on LangdonTactical.com. So I've heard, I've heard a lot of people. I'll mention it like, oh yeah, that's Ernest Langdon's belt. And I'm like, no, it's it like Ernest Langdon loves it too, just like me. But it's the guy behind his name is Brian, and he's in Oklahoma City. So here's uh, here's what I gather from this this belt show and tell. So obviously, me and Jacob are both actually wearing pants. So now <laughs> notice now Brandon and Dan have not showed their belt. So you know is that you know typical of everybody on Zoom meetings now for work? Like people going to work in front of their computer with no pants on, just you know a shirt and tie, but no pants on. Have you heard the story of Jeffrey Tubin? <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. So I, I'm just saying, and we still haven't seen any display from what Brandon yeah. or Dan are yeah, using for yeah, belts. I will not be tilting my camera down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you mine. I didn't, want, I didn't want to take the gun off and all that stuff. Plus, I got to, like, maneuver it so you can't see it on camera because YouTube is all and Facebook. Mine, we'll actually, trust you. We'll take your word for it. No, I want to because I, I like this one. I want to see what you what you guys what your opinion is on this, and I want to see. Um, let's see. There, there's a whole bunch of these. Um, they're one of those like the ratchet style. You know what I'm talking about like oh, every, yeah. every like quarter of an inch you can adjust it. Mm -hmm. um, Infinitely and, adjustable. Yeah, that's great. This one in particular, it's made by Art. Let's see, it says RGB, and I the name is just, it's an abbreviation, obviously, for something, but I can't recall what it is. Um, but it has the, see all the different little... Yeah, I've seen that belt. I'm talking about, yeah. That's not a click belt, is it? Yeah, yeah it's not, you, is it cool? It might be poor. Can you hear it? Yeah. I can't remember what the name of that belt is. I've seen uh, well, there's, yeah, so Core Essentials... Um, a lot of a lot of companies will make these belts with this same uh, same setup here, um, but so do you guys? Do you guys have any experience with that style? I do. I have the next belt is the one that I have. It's that next style. Belt. That's or yep. next That's belt. Um, yeah, and and I think yeah. I, the short answer is it was not my jam. Um, for one, I hate the sound, and I'm actually a guy who adjusts my belt sometimes during the day, right? Yeah. So I'm a guy who's like, oh, I'm like, I'm Big gonna lunch. get up and yeah, I'm gonna walk around. Like if I'm like going into public, I will generally like tighten my belt down because it increases the concealability of my gun. Um, but if I like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna sit in my home office for eight hours in front of a computer, I'll loosen my belt, which will See, cause me to print I... a little bit, but it's more comfortable. 
See, that's why I like this one because I feel like it's really easy to adjust like that. Yeah, I, I can see yeah, that. Like, I can see that, Brandon, because you know, like a Velcro belt, if you need to adjust it, you've got, you know, that deal yeah, going on. You know. So, so I have some of those also, and I, I ended up, uh, I, I, they just weren't for me. I still have them somewhere. I mean, I got a box filled with belts, but it, it just, I, I don't know. I never, I never got used to it. Same thing with like how Jacob, Jacob didn't get used to this style. I, I just couldn't, yeah. I, I couldn't get into it. Well, you know, and it depends on how you carry. That might um, dictate what belt is best for you. In fact, uh, Spencer Keepers, who's one of the real gurus for appendix carry, he told me that um, um, a, a belt that you can finely adjust, not just, you know, to, again, the half-inch increments. He's like, especially for appendix, uh, it's really essential to have that. And I, I found that that's true. I took a class with him a few years ago, and he mentioned that. And since I've been carrying appendix, I find that that is true. It's like there's just that sweet spot that it seems a traditional belt just can't give you. Um, and it's more critical than when I used to carry strong side hip for whatever reason. That that just seems to be how, how it works, especially with appendix carry. So I think a belt that does give you that basically infinite adjustment and very quick yeah. adjustment so you can change it yeah. depending on whatever your activity is is a good thing. Yeah. So, uh, Dan, you don't have to go in the other room and get your pants, but what, what belt do you <laughs> need? <laughs> I kind of I alternate between two. I've got a kind of a tactical belt from Blade Tech that's mm. – it's the webbing, but it's it's thinner. It's like an inch and a half rather than an inch and three quarters, and it's got a smaller cobra buckle, you know, the the the, the tactical one. But because it's thinner, it looks a little less conspicuous. But when it, the, a lot of times, though, most of the time, I'll, I'll have a use a, a belt from a company called Daltec Force, I think they're called, and they make a bull hide belt um, that looks just like a regular jeans belt, but it's stiff enough to really support your gun very well and um doesn't look like uh doesn't look too tactical everybody's saying ratchet belt i'm seeing like 10 comments here they're like it's called ratchet you idiot okay so yeah ratchetgunbelt.com might be yeah i'm like you know it's clicky like this and so yeah so our rgb is more than likely ratchet gun belt <laughs> If uh, if I had to guess, the audience is unforgiving. They will yes. correct you every time. So I think so. We we gotta wrap this up. Um, but I think that I I think we'll do another like a part two of this. Um, you know, and over the months, years, maybe part three, four, five, six. <laughs> you guys have anything to uh, to close with? For me, I'll just say it was a pleasure being with you guys and, and getting to see some of you guys for the first time and uh, very appreciative for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome having you, uh, Dan, as well. He's our, hey. our new new resident. Feels Always like. fun being here. Yeah, and Sal, thanks again for coming. Thank you. Yeah, good panel tonight for sure. Yeah, this was a good talk, and I hope that uh, some people found some benefit to some of this. And so we will be back. Luke will be back uh, with with me. I don't know if any of you guys are going to be here, but uh, next Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern. And not sure what we're going to talk about yet, but we'll uh, we'll post that a day or two ahead of time. So thanks everybody for watching. Thank you guys again for joining me, and we will see you next week.